One of the reasons, again, I wanted you to stand as I approach this message is because I think that we use the Word of God carelessly, recklessly, and we tend to do with the Word of God what Jesus would not want done with the Word of God. While we may put it on the shelf, we also use it as a weapon to hurt one another. We don't proclaim the gospel because we don't know the gospel. You can't give away something you don't know. I think many times as I approach this, time, this, this message about Zacchaeus, I think about Sunday school growing up. I think about the felt board. I think about the little Zacchaeus in the sycamore tree on the felt board. I think about the song, Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man was he. And I think we try to make the gospel cute and we try to make it appealing to little children, but many of us never grow out of that childlike stage. In fact, Paul constantly talks to the church and he goes, I wish you were at this point where you, I don't have to go back to the elementary teachings, but I always got to sit there and go back to the elementary teachings with you when you should have grown up by now. You should have gotten the point so that you can not have to be served all the time, but you can actually do some serving. And so when I come to this message, today's message is really entitled, quite simply, Accepted, Embraced, and Served as the three tenets, one of the three tenets of the gospel. What is gospel? It is good news. But our good news has become perverted and distorted by our ignorance, our prejudice, and our laziness. Take a look at this clip. I love the sin of hating the sinner. Christians talk a big game about love, grace, and forgiveness. But when it comes down to it, do we really mean it? I mean, really? Because I've noticed that Christians, myself included, can be really reactive. One moment we're happily enjoying an after-church potluck. Man, it is just so great to fellowship with other believers and be built up in the faith. Amen. God is so good. I trust him completely in every area of my life. And then the next moment... Did you hear about the latest media-manufactured controversy in the culture war? It's the end of America as we know it! God won't bless us much longer! We're like a big angry mob that just responds out of fear anytime we feel threatened. And we feel threatened a lot. It's like that old song. And they'll know we are Christians by our protests. Change laws, not hearts. Change laws, not hearts. But didn't the guy that the whole Christianity thing is based on, didn't he say not to do that? Jesus, Jesus, we found a woman caught in the act of adultery, Jesus. Should we stone her, Jesus? Let he who has no sin cast the first stone. But Jesus, her sin is worse than mine. Besides, I'm doing this to protect the culture. I'm doing this for you. You're not doing anything for me. It's like we can't control our own lives, so we try to control other people. I mean, sure, by the standards I claim to live by, I'm pretty messed up too, but I I'm not, I mean, I'm, I don't want to talk about me. I want to talk about them, because that's easier than confronting my own issues. How uncomfortable would that be? Dude, you're not going to believe what I just heard about Jim. Oh boy, I bet whatever he did is way worse than talking about people behind their backs. We are such great Christians. I don't want to get to know people I disagree with. Are you kidding me? I'd rather just judge them and feel threatened by them. Besides, some of their unchristianness might rub off on me. So I just try to keep my distance from those people while ignoring the fact that the guy on whom I pretend to base my life, pretty much all he did was hang out with people that made the religious people uncomfortable. Excuse me, sorry. Jesus, you have to take a look at this. Isn't it horrible? We gotta do something quick if we're ever gonna preserve our Christian nation. Hey, hey, how about instead of freaking out about this, you take care of her. But she's not doing anything wrong. Bottom line, it's way easier and more comfortable to my way of living to respond out of fear than out of love. So I'm probably not the best example of Jesus all the time, but much like a real war, we're in a culture war where the ends justify the means. Because we have the greatest, best country ever to preserve here. If America goes under, God has nowhere else to go. So onward, Christian soldiers. 
We will not rest until every law is changed. Until every movie has a Christian message. Until Chris Tomlin is the only music on the radio. Until Duck Dynasty is on television 24 hours a day, 7 days, a Christian week. God bless America! So, probably a little, lot of different reactions here. But if you think about what he's saying in, the, in this uh, message, I think that there's a lot of truth there, especially how we react in our society and how we deal with people and issues and situations that are different and how obvious it is when he kind of parodies that how messed up we actually are and off the mark we are as where we should be. See, you know what? I hear a lot of people talk about, oh, well, we got problems as a nation and all that stuff. Well, the problems in the nation actually are a result of the problems within the church and the problems within the heart of the people in the church. See, I never really look to the nation and to outside people to do much of anything. In fact, Jesus said, I've come to change you. I've come to change your hearts. You are a city on a hill. You are a light to the world. You are the salt of the earth. So if there's darkness, who's the blame? The light. Is it the light Jesus to blame? Nope. It's our light that's to blame. In fact, Jesus says toward the end, the love of most will grow cold. And he's really talking about us. He's talking about his people. Our love grows cold toward one another, yet alone the world outside of us. So we don't even want to hear what we have to say, yet alone them wanting to hear what we have to say. Because again, we don't understand the good news. And the good news is that there are no more barriers to grace. No barriers to grace. Jesus says in Luke 19, 9 through 10, Today, Salvation has come to this house because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save that which was lost. Did salvation come to the house because he was the son of Abraham? Or did salvation come to the house because the Bible tells us that Zacchaeus sought after Jesus and Jesus said, I am coming to your house. See, Zacchaeus is something that we don't do, and I think we don't do it because we've made Jesus very familiar and very much like ourselves. We don't seek after him, so therefore if you don't seek after him with all of your heart, then you won't find him. If you don't find him, how can he ever come to your house? How can he ever come and dwell with you and dine with you and eat with you. But that's what Jesus desires to do, not just to us, but to everybody. And you go, whoa, 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 pastor. What do you mean Jesus wants to dine with everybody? He wants to dine with everybody. In fact, the people that Jesus, remember the people that crucified Jesus? They were the religious folk because they didn't like what he had to say. In fact, when he says it in the Gospel of Luke about how God was blessing all these other people outside of Israel, when he gets up and reads from the prophet there, the people got really upset with him to the point that they wanted to throw him off the cliff, and that was his hometown. His own family, his own friends, the people that he grew up with didn't like to hear what his message was because basically what his message is this, that the floodgates are open to God's grace. That no matter how much your little bitty brain might want to put up a mighty big barrier and a dam to that grace, God's grace overcomes our ignorance, our laziness, and our prejudice time and time again. James 2.5 says, Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen the poor who are it who the poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom and that he promised to those who love him. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. What that means is blessed, happy, fortunate, to be envied are the poor in spirit. And the poor in spirit means that I know that I need God because I am nothing without him. As Joyce Meyer says, I'm an everything nothing. I'm nothing apart from him, but I'm everything in him.
But I understand that I am poor and I am broken and I am wretched. But our problem is this, that we don't get how poor and wretched we are because we're too busy comparing ourselves to one another to understand that we're really comparing ourselves to someone who's broken themselves. It's one broken person comparing to another broken person comparing to another broken person when at the end of the day, that's why we are given the new Adam that is Jesus Christ. The new model, the new creation, so we can look at him and go, not him yet, but thank God I'm on my way. Not him yet because he's the author and the finisher of my faith. He's the one who's in charge. He is sovereign. He is holy. He's good and he's gracious. And you know what our problem is? We make God way too small to fit into our little bitty brains. You see, when I first went to to the university. When I first went to school, I thought that I knew so much, and I found out how little I knew. The more I progress in schooling, here's what I have found after, let's see, how many years of higher education? Uh, let's, I think about 10 to 12 years of higher education, somewhere in there, of schooling. And I have learned that I don't know nearly as much as I could know. I've learned that there's so much out there that I don't know. And about God, I have learned a whole heck of a lot that I don't understand. I've learned that I don't understand. And I think that that's one of the biggest lessons that I have learned, the greatest lessons, that I just don't know and that's okay. Because what I do know is Jesus. What I do know is Him and him crucified. That's it. Like all the rest of this stuff, people go, well, don't, aren't you sure about this, about the rapture and the pre-rapture and this, that rapture and post this and that? I remember getting into arguments with people in school. Is this if I knew anything? You know, here's the thing. I just was merely talking about things that I had heard other people talking about who had heard it from other people talking about it, and nobody actually read the book. Nobody actually read it. Then nobody went, well, is that really what's in there? Where did that idea come from? And isn't that based on how many times we talk about God? It's not based upon our personal revelation, our personal relationship. It's based on what we've heard other people talk about, their personal revelation and their personal relationship. And we just regurgitate it out there, right? We eat it in and we go right back out. But you know what? That's what isn't that what llamas do or what the other one does? Alpacas, one of them spits. And isn't that what we're doing in the world? Where that's all we get. And nobody wants to eat your leftovers. Nobody wants leftovers. We want the real stuff. If you invite me over to dinner and go, Pastor, I like when people do this. Pastor, I'd like to have you over for dinner. We're having leftovers. What? Why would you invite me over for leftovers? One, why would you be telling me they're leftovers? But thankfully, at least if you're honest with me, and let me know that they're leftovers for the get-go. But if you just invited me over for dinner, I'm thinking I'm going to have a real nice dinner and all you're doing is giving me leftovers. In the story of Zacchaeus, here's what happens. Jesus comes over there for dinner and Jesus is the one who serves it up. He's the one who serves it up because he gives a new thing. See, all those people that were talking about Zacchaeus, because there's always going to be somebody talking about you. There are all those people talking about it. They were just talking about regurgitation. They were talking about leftovers. Jesus came to do something new. And that new thing was not to abolish the old thing, but to fulfill it. He wanted to not get rid of the law and all the things in there, but to fulfill it, to show us the new and perfect way that the law was actually pointing us to. Jesus says in Luke 4, 11, 46, And you experts in the law, woe to you, because you, had, you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry, and you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. My friends, this is something within our human nature and within our religious doctrines and everything. We want to tell everybody how they need to change and what that change looks like because we're taught from a very early age, right, color within the lines. You know what God does? He gives us crayons. God actually takes crayons and he goes all over the paper. And in our human nature, we go, no, it has to be in the lines. It has to be paint by numbers grace, right? You know that paint by numbers that teach you how to paint something that looks this certain way? I remember how much they would argue with me in elementary school 
Mary Ellen. Maybe you didn't argue because we're in a relationship now. But no, I, but, but they would argue with me on how I was to hold a pen. And you had to hold your pencil like this way. There was a certain way. You guys remember this? You older folk remember it, right? You had, you had to hold it this way. And I always hold my pen this way. And they would go, no, you have to do it this way. And I would go, but I'm writing. I'm still writing. And they go, no, that's not the right way to write. And I would go, this is ridiculous. You know what? Now they don't even teach cursive. They don't even teach that. And people, the older people are like, back in our day, we loved cursive. We loved writing and cursive. Kids need to know cursive. No, they don't because you know what? It's not coming back. It's a new thing. It's a new day. But I just remembered how much they argued with me about how I had to do it their way to get the same results. Or in math, they used to tell me I had to show my work. You remember that? And I go, why do I have to show my work if I can give you the answer? Really, because sometimes I was cheating. All right, right? I cheated my way through math in high school. I cheated my way through middle school because I didn't get it. Why do, in geometry, why do I have to prove something that's already been proven? Somebody did the work, I delegated it, they know better. You know what I found out now? They don't even teach you how to do proofs anymore in geometry. Because I ran into my geometry teacher literally on Highway 77. No, uh, I wanted to. But I ran into her by... <laughs> But by the way, this woman, I run into her where I get my hair cut because yes, I have a couple hairs that have to get cut. The less hairs you have, the more you got to get them cut, okay? So I, I'm getting my hair cut and she's in there and I go, aren't you Mrs. So-and-so? She goes, not anymore. He dumped me. Oh, okay. <laughs> Didn't you teach me geometry? Yep. And I said, oh, I hated your class. Oh, that made her feel good. I said, no, I appreciate what you did, but I, I, I've never used geometry one day of my life. Well, actually, I do. Every time I get, get up in the morning and try to get dressed, I have to take something this big and fit in something this big. That's geometry, right? But, um, and, and, and she sat there, and, she, and I said, I just never understood why I had to do these proofs. I cheated my whole way through your class. I had the salutatorian of the class sitting right next to me, and nobody thought that the good Christian boy was cheating. But that's what I did. But I would tell everybody else, don't you cheat or you'll go to hell. But thank God I have grace. Amazing grace, you're going to hell. Right, something along those lines. And she goes, well, Robin, we don't teach proofs anymore. What? I was born at the wrong time. I've been always ahead of the game here. But you know what? It doesn't matter how you do it. But isn't that what we yell at God about how he has to do it? Hold the pen this way and do it this way, God. And then we want to tell it because we do that to God. And so because we do that to God, I mean, think about your prayers and think about what your thoughts. You do it to God, right? And then we do it to everybody else. This is how you do it. This is how we do it at Bethany Grace Community Church. We don't sing those songs. We don't do this and we don't do that and... Yeah, you, right? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. And my friends, Jesus gets rid of all that stuff and he goes, you, you're, you're putting an undue burden on people. Who cares how you do it? Who cares how it gets done? God's the author and the finisher. He starts it. He completes it. It's all because of him. And so here's the thing. This is going to turn into a two-part series because I'll finish it next week. I won't keep it too long today because I know you got lunch and you have other things that are more important than here. I got it. I, we just fit him in. 1 Timothy 1, 5, 15, we, we get this good news that God accepts us. He accepts you just as you are. He accepts you and he wants you. I don't want you, but he does. I don't want me. I look at myself in the mirror and I go, what is going on here? The hair that used to be up here is now everywhere but where it's supposed to be. And then all of a sudden, how many of you ever get the, that one nose hair that just like pops out in the middle of the day and it is like, it's like Rapunzel lives up in your nostrils, like right out there. And you, 
It wasn't there in the morning when I was trimming, but it's there now because I got older. And God loves me, nose hair and all. And he loves you with all your imperfections and all your flaws. First Timothy 1 15. Here's a word you can take to heart. This is in the message translation. And you can depend on this. So remember I said there's so much that I don't know. This is what I know. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. I'm proof, public sinner number one, of someone who could never have made it apart from sheer mercy. Public sinner number one. See, you know what? When you get to the point that you go on public sinner number one, now that's not your reason to go out there and do whatever you want. Stop it. Because we're watching you. But it is your reason to go, God accepts me. I don't have to work for it. I don't have to work. Don't you hate having to be around people that you don't know how they're going to react to you and like one minute they're happy and the next minute they're angry and you're like, whoa, what happened there? You know what I'm talking about, those people? You got to walk on eggshells. Nobody wants to be around somebody that they have to walk on eggshells. It's exhausting, isn't it? You're like, wait, I thought you loved me. Now you hate me. Welcome to being a pastor, okay? Oh, I love you, pastor. You, you came to my bedside. And then I hate you, pastor, because you didn't come to my bedside in enough time, right? And we do that same thing with God, but God never does that with us. He accepts us all the time. And like the father in the prodigal son story, he's always out there watching and waiting for us to come home. Waiting. And then when we start coming home, he doesn't make us, see, I would make us grovel on the way to come home, right? I'm so sorry. I'm a mess. Yes, you are. <laughs> now, my aunt will testify to this. And see, when you are not when you don't come to church, I really get to talk about you, right? So my mom's not here, but my mom never accepts an apology graciously, does she? She doesn't. And see, my aunt's shaking her head because my mom will go, I'll say, Mom, I'm really sorry. Well, you should be. <laughs> and then I have flames that come up inside my eyes. And I go, Mom, let's go for a ride right? But Jesus never does that to us, does he? He never does it because he knows all of our flaws. He knows we're going to mess up and he accepts us just as we are. John 1, 12 through 13, but as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. It's all because of God. It's all because of Jesus. It's nothing that you could do, have done, will do, that makes you acceptable, acceptable to God. It's that you just receive. Isn't it just nice to receive something? See, when we get a gift, don't you feel obligated to give another gift? I was talking about this before. Like sometimes I've, like every once in a while I'll give a gift to somebody in the church and I go, I feel like I want to give you a gift or like Christmas time and then you give me like some kind of crappy gift because you know you went out and you're like, oh, they got me a gift. Either I got to go upstairs in the attic where I keep all the other crappy gifts or I got to get them a gift card. So, right, you know, because we just have like a great exchange of cash at Christmas time. In fact, this gives us a great segue into this clip. the nomination for that who among us who best typifies the qualities of Hoodum and Hooderee, the Whoville Holiday Cheermeister. <laughs> My, 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 what an altruistic daughter you have there, Lou. Thank you. Cindy? 
Let me uh, quote a verse from the book of who. Thank you. Ah, the term Grinchy shall apply when Christmas spirit is in short supply. Now I ask you, does that sound like our holiday cheermeister? True, Mr. Mayhew. But the book of who says this too. No matter how different a who may appear, he will always be welcome with holiday cheer. Well, yes, but the, the uh, book also says the, uh, the award cannot go to the Grinch because sometimes uh, things get the uh, lead pipe cinch. You made that up. It doesn't say that. Oh, no, 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 it does. <gasps> what page? Ah. Uh, Oops, lost my, uh, my, my place, but it's, <clears throat> it's, it's in here. But the book does say the cheermeister is the one who deserves a back slap or a toast, and it goes to the soul at Christmas who needs it most. And I believe that soul is the Grinch. And if you're the who's I hope you are, you will too. She's right. <laughs> So I think there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff there that we can think about when we talk about how church does things and how we do things. One, the mayor wanted his nomination. He wanted to be the holiday cheermeister, and he didn't get the nomination he wanted. So, because uh, who, Cindy Lou Who there? Now, who would Cindy represent? Represents Jesus in this whole thing. Hey, I want to nominate the Grinch. I want to nominate the worst smelling, the worst acting person to be the holiday cheermeister to get the award. And what's the reaction? <gasps> Among everybody. And then what do they do? They bring out the book of who. Now, one, none of the people bring out the book of who. Only the mayor brings out the book of who. And he had a, he had a verse ready to go, didn't he? He knew the verse, and then she counteracted with another verse, a little child. And what was the reaction of the people? Going back and forth, back and forth. Who do we listen to? Because the people didn't know themselves what was actually there. And at the end of the day, then he made up his own little thing. You know, kind of like a penny saved is a penny earned. God helps those who help themselves. Children are to be seen, not heard. My grandmother used to like to say that to me a lot. And then I found a verse. And I brought that verse back to her. Do not let anyone look down upon you because of your age, but be an example of purity and found in Timothy and all that. And she said, I don't care what it says. Shut up. Yeah, but yeah right? That's basically. <laughs> and isn't that how we are, right? I don't care what you're actually telling me. Look at this. I just wanted to give you this example. The Bible is clear. Moabites are bad. Deuteronomy 23. They were not to be allowed to dwell among God's people. But then comes the story of Ruth the Moabite, which challenges the prejudice against the Moabites. The Bible is clear. From Uz, people are evil. But then comes the story of Job, a man from Uz, who was the most blameless man on the earth. The Bible is clear. No foreigners or eunuchs are allowed, Deuteronomy 23. But then comes the story of an African eunuch welcomed into the church in Acts 8. The Bible is clear. God's people hated Samaritans. But then Jesus tells a story that shows not all Samaritans were bad. My friends, I had a, pro a seminary professor who described it like this about the Bible. He said, the Bible is God's inspired word. And God, what it says in Timothy, that the Bible is there for teaching, for correcting, for rebuking, for, re you know, for training us in righteousness. But the Bible teaches two things. It teaches us about who God is. And it shows us who we are. And how we, time and time again, what we do is we don't like to, you know why we don't like the idea of grace? Is because we like to accept it, but we also want to be special to keep other people out of it. It's not special if everybody gets it, is it? Right? When we go to people and go, wait a minute, how do they get grace? I want to be part of a special club. I want to be blessed. God chose me. Here's what it says in Genesis 12. 
And I promise this is my last slide. I'm not going on any further, I promise. But who knows how long I can go with this. Genesis 12 says, God, when God calls Abram, listen to this. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. Oh, I bet Abram's going, yes. Okay. I will make your name great and you, oh, yes. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Yes. And whoever curses you, I will curse. Bring it on. And now listen. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. What you talking about, Willis? <laughs> Wait a minute. This is what I tell people. Way to be God's chosen people. We've been exiled. We've been enslaved. We've been hated. And they've tried to kill us from Genesis to Revelation. But we're still here. We're still eating. Right? But here's the thing. We're chosen to be a blessing to the world. We're chosen for everyone else. You mean, wait a minute, when I say all those blessings that we talk about, I praise the Lord, thank you for my blessing, my big house and my nice car and all those many blessings. Maybe they're not blessings. Maybe they aren't. They're just stuff. But maybe the blessing is something different. Maybe the blessing is found, maybe we're told in here what the blessing is. It's a treasure found within us. The treasure that doesn't come from us, but gets spread to everybody else. Maybe the treasure is found in that, that storehouse of grace that we just keep trying to padlock to keep other people out. But look at this passage. Hebrews 11:40. after it talks about the great hall of fame of faith. And by the way, in that hall of fame of faith is a prostitute. God all these men and then all of a sudden we talk about a prostitute and then we go back to talk about men again Pros a prostitute is in the hall of fame of faith what because here's at the end of the hall of fame passage God had planned something better for us so that only what's the word together with us would they be made perfect I just think that God's doing something bigger than our little bitty brains can handle. Stay tuned for next week for the remainder of this sermon. Let us pray. Here's a few reasons why people don't go to church. I can't come to church until I get my life together. Church is how I got my life together. Church is filled with a bunch of hypocrites. And there's always room for one more. All they care about is your money. They care about me, not about my money. Is there some kind of dress code? Yes, the code is wear some clothes. Church, it just makes me nervous. I was nervous at first, and then I felt right at home. I'm not sure I believe everything that you believe. But you can still belong. Church is for wimpy, girly men. You want to say that again? If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't want me. If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't be worried. You can come to my church even if you were brought up Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Jewish, Mormon, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Church of Christ, Southern Baptist, a little bit of everything and a whole lot of nothing. See, it's not about a religion, it's about a relationship. So please, come to my church. Where nobody's perfect. Where beginners are welcome. Where socks are optional. But grace is required. Where forgiveness is offered. Where hope is alive. And where it's okay to not be okay, really.